Hello, I'm Angie DeRosa, Senior Editor of Contemporary OBGYN. In this next video, we host a panel discussion with four experts who weigh in on the impact of climate change to women's health, specifically in adverse obstetric outcomes, including preterm birth, stillbirth, and low birth weight. Two of the panel participants, Dr. Bruce Bacar and Dr. Nate DeNicola, are authors on a recent systematic review published in JAMA Network Open, entitled Association of Air Pollution and Heat Exposure with Preterm Birth, Low Birth Weight, and Stillbirth. Two other panel participants, Dr. Santosh Pandapati and Dr. David Abel, are maternal fetal medicine specialists whose interests include the impact of climate change to human health, specifically to pregnancies. For the systematic review, the objective was to investigate exposure to fine particulate matter, ozone, and heat, and the association of those factors with preterm birth, low birth weight, and stillbirth. In the systematic review of 57 of 68 studies, including 32 million births, there was a statistically significant association between heat, ozone, or fine particulate matter, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. Listen to this very interesting panel discussion and follow us online at contemporaryobgyn.net for more coverage. Thank you. I am thrilled to have all of you here today to share your expertise. And of course, the interview is based on the findings of the uh, Association of Air Pollution and Heat Exposure with Preterm Birth, Low Birth Weight, and uh, Stillbirth in the United States, the systematic review. Uh, recently published at JAMA's Network Open in June, yeah. So what we wanted to talk about with, of course, Dr. Bruce Beckar and Dr. Nate DeNicola, two of the uh, authors on the study, um, and then of course joined by uh, Dr. Santosh Pandapati and Dr. David Abel, who are maternal fetal medicine specialists, and um, who will offer the practitioner's perspective, right, of, of sorts, of why this matters and what practicing OBGYNs can do in their practice to address this with their patients, even again, as we talked about, that it can seem esoteric and that it isn't real on the ground, right? So Dr. Bakar has turned activist. Um, we'll get that in a moment. And Dr. De Nicola leads the environmental health efforts within the uh, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And as a maternal fetal medicine specialist, Dr. Pandapati has delivered the grand rounds um, on this topic. And uh, he and Dr. Abel are very much involved in writing and advocating for these things as well. So we're gonna go in to, um, the, we'll start with the questions. Um, so the review, uh, contributes the largest number of recent studies, right? Focused solely on US population and is the first to your knowledge uh, to combine the increasingly common exposures of air pollutants and heat associated with a series of those ab adverse obstetrical outcomes, uh, preterm birth, low birth weight, and the stillbirth. Uh, with it being the first of its kind study uh, focused on the U.S., I wanted to start with Dr. De Nicola and find out why now. Why is this so important? Yeah, and just to set the stage, um, there's a legacy of these environmental health studies coming after decades of exposure. Sometimes that's how long it takes. Um, this topic is often considered esoteric, but probably the first thing that many providers know about counseling during pregnancy is actually environmental exposure which they'll tell pregnant women, don't eat fish or certain fish. All of that came after decades of industrial waste spillage into Minamata Bay, Japan, that bioaccumulated in the seafood and eventually became mercury poisoning in the children. And so we counsel about that now, almost automatically, maybe not recognizing that was an environmental health exposure and, um, and identification. In that case, it was water pollution, which clearly you would not want to drink water pollution. 
So now we're facing air pollution and we've had decades of accumulated data on this. We wanted to focus on, you know, the here and now. And the here is the United States. Um, we, we certainly, you know, from a society perspective and I think, you know, just a, a citizen perspective, appreciate global lessons and global leadership. Uh, but you do still feel an obligation to serve your, your community. And, and that community that we have is the U.S. Uh, pregnant women and the doctors and women's health professionals who, who take care of them. And so looking at how that group is affected right now by this you know, decades-long accumulation uh, was fairly, a fairly self-evident important question because it could affect this extremely important outcome of the health of pregnancies, which sets the stage for the health of an entire generation. From the studies that we see in, in, my, in my roles, it was clear that there was a signal. There was you know, first one study, then a few more. And whenever you see these, you never wanna make a conclusion right away. You wanna you know, get the whole picture. Yeah. And there were enough that accumulated over, over the recent years that made us stop and say, well, you know, what is the entire picture? You know, maybe there's one study from the US that talks about air pollution and preterm birth. Uh, maybe there's one about heat and stillbirth. But what does the overall body of evidence say? And if it did pose a risk, that would be a very important message for pregnant women and professionals to know about. And so that, that's kind of why we framed the question, uh, why we did. Great. Dr. Bekar, can you speak? Yes. Uh, Nate and I got in touch, and the other two co-authors got aligned around answering the question, is there enough of a signal in the literature now to make any statements about the risk of these exposures? And why we combined heat and air pollutants when we looked at this question was because these are the sort of daily ongoing impacts of the climate crisis. We certainly have warmer days uh, we've always had heat waves, um, we've always had fires, we've always had air pollution from various sources, but there's no question that heat and air pollution are, at least certain types of air pollution, are linked to the climate crisis. And I'm not a researcher, I'm a clinician and an ad activist advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also a big lover of nature, which is why my front yard is in the background of my Zoom picture. Um, and I've been worried about the climate crisis and involved with uh, local efforts to combat it for over 10 years. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a big statement in 2015, a technical report about the impact of the climate crisis on children, and it got a lot of people's attention. But up until our review, I don't think there's been a big picture look at the common impacts of the climate crisis. I mean, we don't, we can talk about climate as being, you know, the perhaps the source of, you know, uh, a raft of hurricanes and tornadoes and superstorms that that drench the the Houston area every couple of years with a one in five hundred year frequency that now seems to be about eighteen months. Those are the kinds of headlines that grab people's attention about the climate crisis, but the ongoing daily effects of more heat and more air pollution are not as well known. So we actually wanted to look and see, as, as Nate was talking about, whether there was a consistent signal out there that, this, that these impacts were affecting birth outcomes in the domestic US all around us. And what we found surprised us and enlightened us, and we've been really eager to share this message because it really stands out. It does. And I wanted to go that, then down to Dr. Panapati and get, you have been speaking about this, you've written about it, and so when you see the study come out that Drs. Bekar and De Nicola have done, what is your reaction to that? Thank you, Angie. And, and I want to thank Drs. De Nicola and Bekar and their colleagues for writing such an important article. To a lot of us, you know, it's proof. Uh, it's proof that this has been an ongoing insult to maternal health, to human health. And I think this is the kind of publication that we need in order to get society to move forward. I think there have been many smaller scale studies that have pointed towards this information, but there has been a inertia, so to speak, in terms of moving society forward. It's time that physicians who are on the ground seeing patients day to day 
actually use data such as this to help push appropriate policies, uh, but also to help educate patients one-on-one. -on -one. I think this is where we have a, an accumulating mountain of evidence that shows associations that are common sense associations if we think about it. We are always paying attention to environment. As parents ourselves, we are looking at what environments our children are playing in, going to school in, uh, meeting up with friends in, and this is adding data to common sense that we already know. I think the point being is also that this, as Nate had mentioned, this is the here and now, but the real concern is that um, this is not a static situation. Um, and what we are worried about is this is a snapshot in time, mm -hmm. but this is going to be a progressively worsening condition if we don't move forward as a society, both nationally and globally, uh, to start helping uh, uh, curb uh, pollutants and uh, 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 heat trapping uh, emissions. And so Dr. Abel, we'd like to go to you then and get your take too, especially with the article you're working on, um, which you and I had briefly talked about. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank you, sure. And, I, and I'd like to echo uh, Dr. Panderpati's uh, comments in thanking Dr. Nicola and Picard for their great work. And I think that this publication is really important for not just OBGYNs, but other clinicians that provide care for pregnant women um, in terms of making this all a reality. It's not uncommon uh, to hear from OBGYNs, sure, I care about climate change. I understand the importance of it. And I understand the relevance of it, but really, how does it affect how I care for my patients? And I think that this publication helps to make it more of a reality for clinicians to understand how important it is in terms of counseling patients and that we can't wait any longer. Um, I do want to add that, you know, I had the privilege of working for the last three years in the central San Joaquin Valley um, in Fresno and Visalia. Okay. Um, Fresno has the highest, um, uh, is, is ranked um, number one often as the city with the worst AQI, air quality index in the United States. And that's where I worked. Um, interestingly, uh, the uh, American Heart uh, Lung Association's recent 20th uh, annual state of the art report, they assessed like unhealthy air across the United States, yeah. looking at like short term particular pollution and, and Fresno was, was number one. So um, th this issue is especially near and dear to me and especially looking at the patients uh, that I took care of in that area where so many issues um, with air pollution um, um, exist. And, and now, thank you for that, Dr. Abel. Let's, let's talk about really, I mean, in this current environment and it goes into the next, you know, Kickstarter uh, statements question, uh, the findings related to the women of color um, within that study. So Dr. Bekar, you said something to me on when we were talking on Monday that you all did not go seeking this information, right? You were going about your study um, and it, it became so apparent that the data stood on its own for the um, obviousness of how black women are at a disadvantage with those negative obstetric outcomes. Um, when we spoke earlier this week, you had commented to me, and I thought it was pretty profound, that the black community is getting hit so hard. And we're seeing that across the board, across the United States with COVID, with everything that has emerged uh, since the George uh, Floyd situation. And you had also said that those findings, that none of it should surprise anyone. So can you elaborate on that in a way where it would be meaningful to the OBGYN listening today? What can they do? Well, there's a whole bunch of questions in there that I could answer, but I want to start out first with just a little bit of information from our research. Uh, we went through over 1800 articles and came up with 68 of them that met our criteria looking at these exposures, heat and air pollution and premature birth, low birth weight and stillbirth that were published in the US peer-reviewed studies 
uh, since 2007 until basically halfway through 2019. And in looking over the results, as, as we put together the tables that summarize the results, it just jumped out that uh, the effects of these exposures on these outcomes, on these very bad birth outcomes, were significantly more common in minority populations. And uh, again, in many cases, these articles weren't even looking for, those, for racial disparities themselves, but that was a common finding. And in particular, I think, what we found was that uh, about a little over 40% of the studies uh, called out racial disparities. And of those, nearly 80% noted that black women and black mothers were more commonly affected with these kinds of outcomes than were uh, other racial groups. And what we found looking at it a little bit more closely was it was more than twice as common amongst black mothers as other minorities, as Latinas or Asian groups, um, and so that was really striking. And it wasn't something that we went looking for, um, but we felt it was important that when the article was published, uh, we were talking a lot about how Black Lives Matter and how important that movement is. And it just seemed that we needed to share that information also and start talking about how Black moms matter too. So as far as what to do about that information, it's an incredibly complicated topic, why it's more common amongst minorities, but we certainly know that the social determinants of health are in play here. Uh, the, the indoor and outdoor environments in which uh, these mothers carry their pregnancies is very significant. And what we're doing with our data now, I think is showing a, a little bit more detail into why those outcomes are occurring. Okay. Uh, that those exposures are worse in those communities and with black moms in particular. And what black, excuse me, and what obstetricians can do with this information is to be aware that when, when uh, minority mothers come to their offices, they are likely not coming from the same places with the same exposures. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a wide variety of exposures and we want to help all the moms when a particular minority mothers reduce their uh, exposures to heat and heat waves and air pollution as much as possible during their pregnancies. As we get more information and more specifics about what time in pregnancy is the most at risk and what types of exposures for what populations, we'll be able to refine those recommendations more. But as a general rule, uh, maintaining uh, uh, those kinds of exposures at a minimum is a really important first step, particularly in the minority communities where that tends to be the most challenging. Okay. And Dr. DeNicola, what can you say? It, Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that does a, um, it, it's a really important topic to address from all these angles. And whenever we're talking about an environmental exposure, it's, um, it's a little unsatisfying to present a risk and not have any kind of means to address it. Um, so I think we do have to remember there are individual counseling uh, that, that can be done. So for example, one of the most common things that, that we counsel pregnant women about is the risk of Braxton Hicks or preterm labor contractions due to dehydration. It's a very clear connection between uh, that being exacerbated by times of extreme heat, uh, either it's, you know, whether it's a heat wave for that month or an especially hot day that week. So that can be incorporated into individual counseling. Where people live uh, does expose them to different amounts of air quality. And, you know, unfortunately, at a certain point, the individual counseling we can give um, has to sort of lead to system solutions. Uh, because we know that many of the minority communities from, from decades of, of the city planning live in what's called heat islands, where their, their areas are much hotter. They will often be closer, these urban um, housing will often be closer to highways, where the air pollution will be higher. So th there, there are individual ways to talk about specific uh, you know, activities outdoors during times of uh, really high uh, air quality index warnings, uh, during times of heat waves. But ultimately, it needs to educate the individual to then um, you know, promulgate system solutions uh, for these, you know, large scoping uh, risks. Dr. Abel, would you like? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think this concept of urban heat islands is, is very important that Dr. Nicola, Dr. Nicola um, uh, touched upon. Uh, understand that the urban landscape 
really makes a lot of these air pollutants even that much more toxic by actually blocking like the scatter of these pollutants. And I think that is important um, for OBGYNs to maybe understand a little bit more about where their patients are living. Um, something that, you know, as a provider, you may not really think about that much, which means try to understand a little bit more about what your patient's life is like and, and, and where they're coming from. I do wanna add that I think it really is a moral imperative here for OBGYNs um, and anyone who provides care of pregnant women to, to educate ourselves and counsel and educate our patients as well. Um, and I use that, uh, uh, more, that word moral imperative, that term you know, with specific intent there, because I really do think it's, it's that important. Um, things like monitoring the air quality index, which a lot of patients have no idea what that is, or PM 2.5 levels, and educating our patients about those kinds of things, I think is very important. Being very uh, careful and discussing things with them about outdoor exercise and activity at times of air, poor air quality and extreme heat. Now, is this easier said than done? For sure, especially when you have a mom that's the sole breadwinner in the family, who may whose work may involve being uh, involved in having these exposures. Um, but it still means that we have a duty um, to educate and counsel both ourselves and our patients. Dr. Panapati. Yeah, I you know I think the important thing to understand is uh, there are disparities. We're talking about. A fixed, vari a fixed change, rising emissions worldwide, but there are granular uh, variations geographically, socioeconomically, racially, that then play a role when we're physicians taking care of patients one-on-one. -on -one. So the challenge, I think where a lot of physicians get lost is saying, okay, CO2 levels are rising. What do I have to do about that? and get lost at this stratospheric level, as opposed to saying, wait a minute, there are areas from that research that directly pertain to our patients. And I think that's where we as a healthcare community and where a very important publication like this is helpful. It starts laying the groundwork to saying to physicians, you have to be part of this solution. Yes. You are also, important to communicate the scientific knowledge and bring it down to a real world level. When I talk to patients and I work in the Bay Area and when we had the uh, fires here not that many years ago, the air quality was amongst the worst in the world for periods of time. And this was very much on everybody's mind, but no one knew what to do about it. And no one had, uh, clear guidance as far as how to advise pregnant mothers, how to advise individuals in general, how much exposure is reasonable, how much exposure should I avoid, what measures should I take to mitigate my exposure. Um, and I think the wildfires were an example that equalized exposure. So climate change is coming for all of us. It won't, at the end of the day, be just certain vulnerable populations, because if we keep ratcheting up our emissions, if we keep ratcheting up our uh, heating, after a certain point, no one is uh, invulnerable in these situations. And I think that's where we have to say, we have to worry about the vulnerable, but at the end of the day, we're all vulnerable. And I think it's important to understand that, again, as I mentioned, this isn't a fixed situation. Right. And that's the scary part about all of this, right? And so we need to start addressing the vulnerable populations first. And we need to have policies in place, as um, uh, Nate and Bruce are uh, alluding to, that allow people to live healthier lives, that allow people to avoid exposures, that then propagate onto the rest of the population as well. Um, so I think we have absolutely, as David said, a moral imperative. This is our oath to care for the well-being of our patients. And we have an ethical uh, duty uh, to speak out. And that's where Bruce's activism um, becomes necessary. And I think, you know, a lot of people criticize scientists and physicians who become activists because it's convenient to criticize them. 
But the reality is if you're looking at data and the data says that a disaster is coming, and if you stay silent about that, then which side of history are you really on here? And I think after a while, it's hard not to become activists in this arena when the data is staring us in the face. Uh, and so I think this is our role uh, yeah. to, in, through forums like this, to educate uh, the healthcare community. And I think now, and I've heard it from a couple different um, experts that I've talked with, by the way, you know, COVID itself, you know, there's a belief that this has come about because of the climate issues. And I think that we're in a time when hopefully more people will be awakened to it and that this, there are the pockets of situations, right, that we've seen, the Flint water crisis, I think about the fracking. Um, there are pockets that I've paid attention to. I was sharing this with Dr. Bakar on Monday, an ovarian high rate of ovarian cancer in a pocket in Illinois, right? Why does that happen? How do you, how do you look at that? Um, and how do you explore that across and make it meaningful for people to pay attention? While it's happening in pockets, they may see it as an, an aberration in their own lives, right? This is not what's the real impact of climate change and may want to ignore it because it's easier, right? Over, over time. But I think with these things going on, it's harder and harder to ignore it. So, and with the studies coming out and being able to equip practitioners to do and um, counsel. So I wanted to go to that a little bit more talking about, for example, Dr. Panapati, uh, contraception, diet, what are the other elements? And we'll start with Dr. Abel on that. Yeah, there's, there's so much to talk about here, contraception, uh, nutrition, um, preconception counseling. Um, so I'll just touch on a little bit of it. Um, you know, one thing about, you know, with contraception, you know, the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change. That's one of the, the big bodies from the UN that looks at all the data and kind of tries to make sense of it all. You know, they yeah. released this report in 2014, and they talked about how slowing population growth is an intervention that could be really impactful in terms of reducing emissions and also decreasing maternal deaths. And also keep in mind that, you know, slowing, you know, rapid population growth will also aid in countries that are vulnerable to climate change um, and allowing us to develop more adaptive policies. And it doesn't just have to be, you know, third world developing countries. It could be right here as well. So, certain things like shifts in maternal age and increased birth intervals um, that could result from, you know, greater access to, you know, reproductive health services um, can reduce both maternal and child mortality. So again, like we see in terms of the mitigation efforts here, right, that's a, this big hot topic right now is mitigation efforts. You know, there are many co-benefits that extend way beyond just lowering greenhouse gas concentrations. And I think that that's very important for OBGYNs um, uh, to realize. Um, just real briefly, I think it's also important in, as we talk about nutrition, that, you know, anemia and malnutrition um, are issues that exacerbate already existing racial disparities, as we know. So if you can imagine uh, many of these women already at high risk yes. live in areas yeah. that are essentially food deserts, okay? Which yeah. in essence means limited access to nutritious foods, like fruits and vegetables, they're often too expensive to purchase. So you have this intersection of several variables. You have poor air quality, in urban heat islands, increasing heat in index, which is getting worse as fossil fuel emissions continue. And then you have inadequate nutrition and they all contribute to the increasing risks um, uh, during pregnancy as well. So OBGYNs are going to have to pay even more attention to how climate change can pose risks to nutritional health and counsel patients accordingly. This could also mean that if a patient of yours has access to a nutritionist that you may consider a referral and perhaps not just one in follow-up visits um, throughout the pregnancy and even asking your patients more about their diets which is something that we may do but may not do that much 
starting to think about these things a little bit more and how we frame our conversations a little differently because of climate change, I think are going to be important. Japanapati. Uh, absolutely. Sorry, just unmuting there. Uh, the, the modeling is very clear that if you can provide access to contraception for women who seek it, so we're not talking about enforced contraception, what we're really talking about is liberty here and women's liberty and freedom of choice. And so when women have access to contraception unrestricted, uh, we're talking about tens of gigatons of emission reductions from the avoidance of deliveries that were never intended. We're also talking about hundreds of thousands of lives saved, as Dr. Abel, as David was saying, uh, from you can't die from a pregnancy you never had. Uh, you, you can't die from a pulmonary embolism due to a pregnancy or postpartum hemorrhage due to a pregnancy or severe preeclampsia that um, you know, occurred from a pregnancy that you never had. So I think this is very much about human liberty, human choice. Uh, when we are uh, counseling patients, um, we are often, frankly, it's easier in the maternal fetal medicine specialty because we have patients who are high risk yeah. and they take it seriously many times that we, when we say, you know, maybe you should be avoiding a future pregnancy because of your very poor diabetes or your very significant hypertension or lupus or what have you. I think the challenge is greater in the general OBGYN community. We see from the legislative standpoint, erosion in common sense day in and day out. Recently, the ruling by the Supreme Court um, indicating that employers have the ability to withhold coverage for birth control. Outrageous. And I think when we're talking about health, we need to have government out of the relationship between physicians and their patients. And I think we should base our policies on science, not, um, you know, ideology. So I, again, I think the data here is very clear that um, environmental exposures are dangerous. I think the reality is um, we have a limited amount of time to make a difference here. And our limited time is decades. Um, so very much within our lifetimes yes. Uh, yes. where we need to start bending the curve. You had alluded to COVID as uh, potentially being related to uh, climate change. And I think what it's really related to is our globalization. And the same efforts that have led to globalization and easier trade have allowed for an explosion of emissions, particulate emissions, fossil fuel consumption, et cetera. So um, it's a uh, symptom of a um, system that is uh, not functioning to promote health. Um, absolutely, as David says, we have to talk to patients about nutrition and when we can talk about advancing patients to eat more plant-based foods, we're actually also talking about cutting emissions. So this doesn't have to be that physicians have to be telling their patients to get electric cars and put solar panels up. This is about the fact that improving health actually cuts emissions and we have a very central role to play. Uh, and I think this is lost to many healthcare providers. Dr. De Nicola, let's get your take on counseling. Yeah, I, I will have two points that I'll make here. Um, one is to just highlight that, that in this increasingly technologically capable and globalized world, the role of scientific leadership and medical leadership is ever more important. And specific to obstetrics and gynecology, we actually play a very central role. Um, every problem we face in the world right now, whether it's poverty or hunger or water access, all of that becomes much more complicated whether we go from our current 7.5 billion people to 9 billion or 12 billion. And nobody knows where that's gonna go, but it definitely is related to population dynamics. And these population dynamics are, are massively influenced by things that obstetricians and gynecologists uh, work in. So things like access to reproductive services, empowerment of women in society, 
but but here here's the main point actually is that the most effective intervention to achieve what I think most would agree is the preferred dynamic of mm -hmm. low maternal mortality, low infant mortality, yes. lower turnover. The most effective intervention is education for young girls and boys, uh, but primarily education for, for the young generation. It's a very low cost intervention um, that has many just kind of inherent, um, I think fairly you know, self-evident benefits, but one of them is to help us just have a more stable global population dynamic for, for the growth that we, that we you know, prefer. Uh, so that, that's, that's the one point that I'll make there. I just want to take a second to mention in counseling also one other important finding that's, that's not exactly related to this, but I think is worth mentioning, which is whenever we have this environmental exposure without an intervention, again, it falls kind of flat. But what we saw in our research, uh, not one of the 68 studies we included, but in our discussion, was that in California, over a 10-year period, when they retired coal power plants, yes. the preterm birth rate dropped. 25%. We have maternal fetal medicine specialists here who I think will admit some genuine envy over any intervention that can decrease preterm birth rates by 25%. So it's, it's not a um, simple individual action to do to say, you know, change the amount of uh, coal power plant emissions in your region, but it is something that, that uh, does come under at some point some community control. And so I, I think that it's important to highlight the good news in this. You know, it's, it's like telling a, a person who smokes that if they stop smoking, the risk for lung cancer goes back to baseline after a certain amount of time. That can be motivating. And we're finding a similar thing with uh, reducing air pollution and getting those health benefits in not that much longer of a, of a time. Okay. Dr. Bikar, we'll let you wrap it up for us. Well, first of all, those are big shoes to fill. I'm just so appreciative of the, all the people on this panel. I learn a lot every time Nate and I talk. And Santosh and David, thank you so much for contributing all of your wisdom. And I know we're all just getting started in this work. Uh, but two things about counseling. First of all, I don't want to heap more work on already overworked and very, very busy colleagues of mine in terms of counseling. But there are uh, medical centers where they're doing a really good job. I, I, I'm thinking of Cheryl Holder's work at Florida International University, where they really spend a little bit of time with uh, patients, spend a little time with their, uh, their staff looking into programs that might actually be able to help them uh, pay their utility bills or do something about their indoor air quality. Uh, a lot of programs are available that patients aren't aware of and practitioners don't really have time to learn about, but uh, their staff can learn and distribute that information and may be able to empower patients to reduce their exposures without taking more physician time and actually in increasing patients' overall health too, not just pregnancy outcome, which is a really worthwhile effort. So I think a more organized effort within doctor's offices to help patients find what is available to them in terms of assistance might make their outcomes better and everyone's lives better. So that's one side of the counseling I wanna throw in. Okay. Uh, the other is that there's a population that really is in need of counseling from physicians and that is elected officials and legislators. They need to hear from doctors. And uh, you know, my, with my activist hat on, and I stopped seeing patients seven years ago, I have a very, very consistent experience that even when I walk into uh, hostile territory with very conservative and cautious and climate denying legislators, I've always been treated with a great deal of respect and appreciation by elected officials. And they also pay really good attention to the, the information that we bring from a health perspective. One of the really underappreciated aspects of climate activism is whatever we need to do to lower CO2 is gonna take a while to have an effect. Uh, but it has immediate benefits on the health side. And if you tell uh, an elected official or someone who's crafting policy to in increase the amount of renewable energy uh, in the district or something like that, that the benefits will accrue that, that you know, that legislator's uh, child who has asthma or uh, older parents that have heart disease will probably live a longer, happier life if we make this change. And if you look at them and smile at them and they know that you're an educated health professional, you can have a big impact on future policy. And as Nate was saying earlier, 
I think we need to look a little broader uh, as physicians at our role. And, and, and Santosh was pointing this out too, that the size of this crisis and its potential to undo the stability of, of nature itself means we all got to get out of our silos and not just look at our careers as though they exist within the walls of our institutions. We need to stop this problem called the climate crisis. And, and importantly, doing that is gonna benefit our patients literally the next day. So uh, this is a real opportunity for ph physicians. I always remember the Clean Air Act was, was framed when it was passed in the 1970s uh, as a health problem, as a health issue, uh, not as an environmental one. So we need to raise the flag of health when we talk about climate and specifically talk about pregnant mothers and their babies, because who deserves to be protected more? Who's more important to protect than them? So that's, uh, that's one kind of summary. And yeah. thank all of you so much for your time today, for all that you're doing on each level where each of you is practicing. Thank you. Okay. So much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity.